All right. Um, I think I'll get started. Um, welcome all. Uh, my name is Stephen Curran. I'm uh, from Cloud Compass Computing, and I work closely with the government of British Columbia and have been for several years on Hyperledger Indy, Aries, um, self-sovereign identity, trust over IP, and all sorts of related issues. So this um, topic is about uh, traversing the web of trust. How do you determine as a verifier whether you or not you should trust the issuer? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'll start with just a brief reminder of the uh, trust over IP um, verifiable credential triangle and the interaction. So an issuer provides in the paper world, um, provides a credential, a piece of paper to a holder. That holder holds on to that and that ends the um, uh, conversation, the interactions, the transaction between the holder and the issuer. Um, sometime later, the holder is asked by a verifier to prove that they have been issued a credential, uh, whether that be a driver's license, a passport, um, a membership card, a loss of, uh, you know, a proof that you're a lawyer, proof that you're a real estate agent. Um, they're asked by the verifier. The verifier looks at the card they're given, the piece of paper, and they decide if they trust it. And so they're basically deciding if the document's been forged, if the piece of paper is a forgery if that person that's giving them is likely to be um, someone they can trust. Once you go to verifiable credentials, um, that problem changes and that the, the part of it of what the verifier has to do changes. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, uh, to remind everyone of the verifiable credential model, um, a issuer writes uh, cryptographic material, publishes it somewhere, often it's to a blockchain or a ledger, something like Hyperledger Indy. Um, but could be um, using Microsoft stack to Bitcoin uh, or anchored in Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, the issuer then is able to use the private key associated with the public key they publish to sign credentials, sign verifiable credentials, digital documents that they give to the holder. And once again, just like the paper model, the transaction between the issuer and the holder is complete. Um, the holder then, uh, connects with and, and um, is asked by a verifier to prove that they have possession of that credential and maybe some data from that credential. So they're asked to um, provide a proof. So they don't provide the credential itself, but they provide proof that they have that credential that's cryptographically signed. The verifier reads the public key information that the issuer published and uses that information to verify um, the document that they've been given, uh, the cryptographically signed um, digital document. Um, once they've done that, they've verified that the issuer did indeed issue the credential, that the holder has it, that it has not been tampered with, with and potentially that it's not been revoked. So all of those things are known. That gets rid of the verifier having to inspect the document and decide if it's real. But what that doesn't get rid of is the issue of does the verifier trust the issuer? And it becomes a little more opaque, although um, uh, uh, when it's done digitally, but um, in many ways it becomes much more feasible, um, uh, again, related to the ability to forge the document. Um, takes away that ability for somebody, uh, you know, on the internet to construct a document that looks like a driver's license and sell it to somebody that looks to the verifier like it is um, a driver's license. They could still do that. They would have to simulate they're the issuer and, and that's what we're trying to prevent and um, ways to prove that the issuer truly is um, who provided the document. So basically the trust challenge then on verifiable credential is you've got to know your issuer. Um, there's real world methods for doing that. We're gonna talk about those, um, but how do we transition those to online? Um, it is an aside here that um, we do want to keep the um, verifiable credential model, which is I'm not going to talk about where the issuer simply asks the or the verifier asks the issuer for the for the credential data. Um, we don't uh, we try to avoid that model um, generally because um, we don't uh, part of the privacy and, and we want is that the issuer gives the credential to the holder and then they use it wherever they want without having to. Um, ping back to the issuer to ask, or, uh, you know, Stephen wants to go buy some cannabis, Mr. Government, is, is, is he old enough to do that? Um, we don't want all those transactions tracked by the issuer. Basically the login by Facebook problem. 
Okay, so what are the approaches we have for determining whether we trust the issuer? So one approach is simply as a verifier, we only accept credentials from known issuers, people we already know about. And this is done in, in, in one of two ways. Um, within uh, ARIES and within the, the software, um, you can ask in the proof request, uh, you must provide uh, a, a credential from a specific issuer of a certain type. So a BC driver's license or your Canadian passport, and that's specified. And so only um, those credentials would uh, satisfy the proof. Um, the issuer is already known and, and you must provide it from those issuers. Um, a reactive way to do that is to have a list of issuers that you accept and then tell the person, I'll accept any issuer, I'll accept a driver's license from any province in Canada, but I know who the 14 issuers are of driver's licenses in Canada, because there are only 14. And, and I'm going to make sure um, both that your credential passes, that the cryptography works, but also that one of those issuers is, is um, been used. So that's the small scale um, approach that is currently common, but of course, that the problem with that is scale. It doesn't scale when there are many, and for global use cases, many, many issuers. And if those issuers are constantly changing, if there's new issuers being added, if there's issuers being removed and so on, uh, that causes uh, problems with this approach. You just It just doesn't scale. Um, you're back to just looking at inspecting the issuer. Um, so examples of this, um, all sorts, but ac ac academic credentials is where a lot of the work in, in verifiable credentials started and, and it's a very real problem. Um, the solution in academic um, circles is generally you go, whenever you must know that a person graduated from university, you require, you, you call back to the issuer and you get them. The vaccination providers has been a big one, obviously in 2021, um, being able to prove um, that you have a proof of vaccination and being able to um, uh, know that the issuer that provided that is a, uh, a genuine issuer of that. Uh, business licenses, since business licenses are generally municipal across the world, you know, each city issues them, uh, knowing it's a business license is difficult, even in a relatively small area where there's many communities. Um, supply chain, huge, um, where customers might want to check to see who issued a credential about a product. So that's a, a another big um, place. There's all sorts of them across uh, across anywhere that you go beyond local problems. Um, the second way you do it is you just outsource the problem. You just pr create a, uh, have a central place that you check on a list of issuers and verifiers can subscribe to that list and they can get it. So this is basically the public model. Um, IATA, the um, Travel uh, Association, has a great system for called Tomatic um, that I never knew about, but I learned about in the uh, vaccination world um, as I've sort of investigated in that. And Tomatic is a pretty cool system for travel rules. Basically, they collect all the data from nations um, as, as rules change about what travel is allowed between different places. So if a, a place becomes dangerous to travel to, uh, that would go on a list of dangerous places to travel. And so um, Thematic lets uh, 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 an airline contact about a passenger who was flying on airline X going to, um, going from place X going to place Y, and what are all the rules associated with that combination of things. So they maintain a central database and the airlines use an API to get that information. So that's a, another common way to do it and a way that um, is likely to be, be very common initially. So not inherently bad, but it is centralized. And, and part of the goal we've got is to decentralize things and making, making it easier. As well, um, because verifiable credentials allow many use cases, um, they, they can be much smaller than can be justified in putting together a centralized database of these things. So there's operational overhead, there's governance and technology involved, security, uh, all the things you have with a central registry that you that is um, got to be maintained. So um, we'll go on to look at decentralized ways of doing that. So that's what we're um, going to focus on from from this point on in the in the in the conversation. Not to say that the other ways are bad. Um, but let's talk about decentralized ways to do it, where, where we don't have that central registry and, and if we have a scaled problem. 
Um, today, uh, if you got a paper credential from an unknown uh, issuer like this um, diploma that I've got on the screen there, uh, which is actually from the University of Suffolk, which I didn't even know existed in Boston, I believe. Um, it's a law degree. Um, you Google the issuer, you figure out who the issuer is, you Google them, you decide if their website looks real. Um, you look for correlating data. This this candidate for a job has presented this credential from a from this university and you have no idea if it's real. Um, you might even, if it's important enough, contact the issuer to see if they are indeed quote, real. And then ultimately a human decision is made. Am I gonna trust this or am I not gonna trust it? Um, and, and, and you go from there, you make that decision. So that's kind of the model we're, we're gonna look at. Um, as well, the, the natural state of things that has evolved is that you have local hierarchies that build up um, of, of authorities to, to issue credentials, um, to issue, um, to be authority over topics. So if you think of, Universities of, of lawyers, say, for example, or real estate agents, um, you would have a local group that would self-organize. And then ultimately, there'd probably be a regional authority that says, oh, this is the way that within the province of British Columbia, we decide who a lawyer is. And of course, British Columbia is part of Canada. So we probably have an organization across the country to do that. Um, locally, we get consistency, and this is why this this approach ha has built up, is because when we're dealing with paper and we're dealing with people we, we interact with um, in person, um, that makes sense. It's locally consistent, but very different across jurisdictions. And basically, every time you cross a, a jurisdictional line in these um, silos, uh, you, you create this trust. Just because a lawyer is allowed in British Columbia, that doesn't mean they're allowed in Alberta. Um, as we go uh, you know, beyond that into the states, well, then it becomes even more questioned. You know, what, well, what does it mean for British Columbia to authorize a real estate agent versus what is done in Nevada, say? You know, it, it varies across jurisdictions and jurisdictions are um, less, you know, are, have different rules and, and different trusts of other jurisdictions. So what does authorized issuer mean? So, um, Decentralized KYA, um, know your issuer with verifiable credentials. So um, this proposes a, uh, a, a protocol that can be used for figuring out if you trust the issuer. So I'm going to talk about that for a bit and then talk about another way to apply that in perhaps a more practical way. So first, um, our starting point when, we've, when we're a verifier, we've got a credential from, um, from our, our prover. Um, from that credential, we know the data of the issuer. We don't really know who that identi you know, who that identifier represents. We just know a, a, we, we know a resolvable identifier. We have a public key, generally, that we can use, and we have an endpoint to contact the issuer. And with Aries, that's enough to be able to actually establish a connection with the issuer and ask them, uh, have an exchange of information, messaging, and including in that the ability to request proofs from that entity. So that's one thing we've got. Um, we know that they issued a certain type of, of verifiable credential, but we're trying to figure out whether they're authorized to. Um, we also know they're allowed to write to a given ledger because they put their, they anchored their information in that ledger. So um, that also gives us some information. If it's a closed ledger, if it's not a public ledger, that actually may be enough. There's a program in Canada for um, known traveler um, that's a combination of the World Economic Forum, um, Transport Canada, which is the authority for transportation at the federal government, at the federal level, and um, uh, Netherlands authorities, Dutch authorities, uh, and the same, you know, Transport Dutch, whatever, uh, Transport Netherlands, whatever the organization is called there, I'm not as familiar. Um, but basically, they have a, a closed ledger that only certain people are allowed to write to and only allowed to verify with. And so that actually would be enough to know um, that we can trust the, uh, the, the issuer. So I'll, I'll set that aside, but just wanted to throw that out. as That's another option. Um, traversing the web of trust, it, what I thought about in doing this is sort of um, recursively figuring out who has the authority um, to do this. So start with the issuers did. Uh, so the idea here is that you're going to um, 
figure out what authority the person, the, the entity has to issue the credential. And so an algorithm for doing that is basically this. Um, I, I have the issuers did because I've verified it and I know it's a real, you know, a real issued verifiable credential that, that checks out. So the verification work, um, I, I might have a cache of known issuers that I uh, either is empty or I'm building up as I go. And I have their status of trusted or not trust, trusted. Basically, I do this. I recursively find, look for the did and the status in the cache. If it's there, I'm all done. I can just take whatever it says. If, if it's not in the cache yet, what I've got to, what I can do is use the information in the public did for the entity to connect to them and ask for their proof of authority to issue that credential. Why are you allowed to issue the credential that I received? Um, I may get a response, and, and if I get a response, I get another verifiable credential back, and I can actually check start the whole process again with that did. Um, if I don't get a response, um, I then have no option but to pass it to a human to make a decision on what uh, it happens. And again, that's the end of the uh, recursive algorithm. Uh, either way, either I find uh, the did in the in the uh, cache, or I uh, pass it to a human. Either way, I get a decision out of that, either trusted or not trusted. And for any um, recursion I've done through that, I can apply that same result to all of the other dids that I've encountered in doing this. And so I update the cache with the resulting chain of issuers. So how does that look? Um, this is another representation of that. Basically, I start with my issuer did. Um, I check to see if it's in my cache. If it's not, I ask the issuer, hey, what's your authority for issuing this? If they give me one, I loop back. If they uh, don't give me one, I either make a human decision or perhaps I just reject it out of hand. Um, if, if I have to go to that, I might just reject it and say it's not trusted. Then, I go, then I'm going back to the holder to say, hey, that, uh, that credential you gave me, I can't use it. Uh, you need to provide something else. And now you're into negotiation with your holder. Oh, out of the picture. Um, the other one is you do find it in the cache that ends your process and you have a result. It's either trusted or untrusted. Um, and then, as I said, once you get a result, if you've had to traverse other uh, entities, you would add those to the cache. So that's the algorithm there. Um, an example of that. So I get a, a, I get a credential from a university. I'm a, a company. I'm hiring. I get a, a, a transcript from a university. Um, that university, uh, when I ask them, gives me a credential from a regional consortium of, of universities. So it might be the British Columbia um, Post-Secondary Schools Association or the university, universities and colleges of, of British Columbia. So um, uh, I've, I've not heard of them, so I go back. Oh, British Columbia came from British Columbia. Well, actually, um, I'm somewhere in the States and I've never heard of British Columbia or at least their authority to issue credentials. Ah, but that's part of Canada and Canada has um, is a trusted entity. I do know about Canada. So I now have a decision. I have a trusted uh, that I trust uh, the issuer. Um, and so I can accept the presentation from the holder. So I'm good to go with that. And along the way, I can update my cash for these three things. And the next time I have to go through this type of process, I can stop at um, level B. I can stop at that first level and, and provide that. So it's a recursive way to figure out, do I trust the issuer? Um, so enablers for making this concept happen. Um, obviously, there's got to be use cases where verifiers are accepting presentations of verifiable credentials from arbitrary users. Um, one of the things we talk about when when we talk about getting started um, with verifiable credentials and the use of, of trust over IP is start with use cases where you know all the parties, um, where you don't need to have this problem and you know who the issuers are, the verifiers already know that, so they don't have to worry about it. So obviously, you, we wouldn't get this going until we have arbitrary issuers. Um, the um, Proof of vaccination, boy, there's a case where we need it, and we need it fast if these 
um, proof of vaccinations are going to be used for travel or for crossing jurisdictional lines. Um, we really want a human machine readable authority to issue protocol. I'm going to want to be able to go back to an issuer and send them a message saying, hey, tell me your authority of why you're allowed to issue that. And they understand it and respond to it in a, in a machine way. Um, also like a human way to do it so that the human, if, if it does come down to a human decision, that they collect information along the way to do that. Um, Oversight organizations need to issue authority to uh, need to issue those authority to issue verifiable credentials. Uh, basically, we we wind up with each silo, local silo, building up to a national one, a quasi certificate authority governance framework. That's really what we're creating. Is we're we're um, building out the trust by having an authority issue a credential to an issuer, saying you're allowed to issue this um, credential and. I've talked about fairly obvious ones, you know, governments, uh, academic organizations, but it, it can go into IoT, it can go into ISO certifications. There's all sorts of governance authorities around that, that would benefit from this type of capability. Um, we would also want to be able to do automated data collection if we did enable human, if we did have a human decision point on it. Um, a did document can have an also known as attribute, which can be a domain name. And so that could be used as a way to enable uh, human decisions. You could collect additional information. You could do the Google searching beforehand so that when you pass all the data to the human that's gonna make the decision, um, that uh, that searching has been done. They're not you know, getting online and doing that searching. At least, you know, they can at least know who to contact if they're gonna do that part of it. Um, Challenges, um, need a common authority to issue a verifiable credential, a decentralized authority, if you will. So that's one of the things that um, we're hoping to get to with some of the work we're doing in, in British Columbia around that. Um, next up, um, definition of what authority to issue means. Um, so there's a couple of things, looks like I missed a link in here to add, but um, ARIES RFC 430 is called Machine Readable Governance Frameworks. And the idea there is um, that um, you can run this protocol to figure out what governance framework the issuer is a part of and how to determine if it is um, behaving properly within the governance framework um, guidelines. Um, so again, it can contribute to your trust decision. Um, the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework, which is the link that I missed in here, um, I'll get that added is um, a framework that defines um, levels of assurance, what, what that means, what it means to issue an identity credential, for example, for government to issue such a thing and, and, and how a verifier should interpret it and things like that. So expanding out on these idea on the authority to issue. Um, issuers have to be always on to respond to that authority to issue proof requests. Um, and a human decision may be needed anyway. So there are some challenges in there. Um, potential op optimizations is you start not with a full cache, but just a partial cache of, you know, in the example I gave, you know, Canadian, the Canadian and, and BC level things, the um, national governments across the world and uh, coming from an authority like the UN or something like that. And then the, uh, regional authorities within a national authority, so provinces and things like that. That can be a partial cache that would allow you not to have to fill up the whole tree yourself, the whole cache, um, right from scratch. Um, I throw this out there just, if, if a human decision is made, you wanna put an expiration on that and you wanna figure out when to revisit that decision. You wanna, you know, at least every six months or every year reevaluate re that issuer to see if they still have a good reputation, if they still can be trusted. Um, one of the things you can do is include a uh, potentially, this isn't there yet, but potentially prove a proof of an authority to issue inside the credential that's presented by the holder. Um, this is the thing called chain credentials. There's a really super interesting ARIES RFC 104 um, you can take a look at where you actually embed a proof within a proof. Um, so that the authority, the proof 
uh, the issuer puts a proof inside the proof given to the holder. So that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, Trust over IP has a group, a working group called Authenticated Chained Data Container that is associated uh, with the same issue. And then we can look at um, decentralized trust registries. This is the last thing I wanted to touch on, which is sort of a combination of the central registry and uh, decentralized authorization. So you do have registries. Um, they're registries of verifiable credentials, so VCRs. Um, authorities would run those. And then um, the VC that you give, instead of um, containing a proof itself, which would be even better, but you could have the VC contain a URL to a VCR where you can look up the um, the authority of that issuer to issue a credential. So as part of the VC itself, you probably, here's how you check on this. Um, the verifier may have to know valid VCRs, which takes us right back to our original problem. How do they know uh, which VCRs they trust, which uh, credential registries they trust? Uh, requesting proofs from the VCR to do that. And then they're back to figuring out how they trust those. The idea here though, is this is a much smaller unit of things. And so these are things you could collect ahead of time in a reasonable amount of time and effort. Um, Good Health Pass, um, the work done at Trust Over IP for um, verifiable credentials related to vaccinations and, and um, COVID testing, um, released its interoperability paper uh, this past Monday. The Trust Registry is section 7.2. Um, this image is actually comes out of that and I credit them for putting that together. So that's a way to do the, basically the same sort of idea I have, but without uh, I, I provided earlier with the traversing web of trust idea, but um, comes out to a trust registry um, basis. So you, you're you going to a, a quasi centralized place, but that is um, decentralized in nature. And with that, um, that's what I had to talk about. Um, you know, uh, you want an approach that is uh, assessing issuers that is both decentralized and scalable. Um, uh, Aries and, and verifiable credentials enable a model for that web of trust. Um, great governance is needed. So even though you've you've got uh, a mechanism to do it, the technical mechanisms, you really also need to have the governance around it. And with that, um, that's the presentation I had. I'm a couple of moments early, so I don't know if there's questions over there. Uh, I see there's something there. Uh, Will has posted some information I didn't get a chance to read. Where is the cache initi instantiated? Um, so probably by now you've got to figure it out. So the original cache is with every verifier. And so in, you know, from, a, from the lowest common denominator model, it's every verifier sort of builds it up from nothing. Um, ideally, you pre-populate um, pre it with, with data you already know. And then the other side of it is that you can use um, um, uh, the, these trust registries idea where um, you can not have a single central, uh, central authority, but you could have um, groups of authorities and, and figure out and, and constrain your trust problem to trusting the VCRs and the managers of, of the VCRs. Um, well, I don't want to, that, that's a lot to write. Um, good stuff. And, and there's a good link in there. I can add that to this. Um, but I don't have time. I don't want to read it while I, we're sitting on on the call. So, um, with that, um, I think we're over. Uh, so I will end the presentation now. I hope uh, hope that was helpful.